Ted Helms. I'm the executive director of the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce, and we're really delighted to once again uh, host Educando. Uh, it's very good. We no longer call it World Fund now Educando. It's really taking uh, taking effect, uh, and obviously, I think it, it, it allows the chamber to fulfill its mission, not only promote trade and investment, but understanding and, and provide a community service. Ten years ago, I was invited by the uh, the Science Commission of the Brazilian Senate, Federal Senate, to give a presentation to them about what did I think was going on with Brazilian education and what could be done to change or improve, uh, you know, the, the 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 landscape, so to speak. And I started, you know, so we had a bunch of senators there, quite a few of them. And because it was open to all members of the Senate, and I started like this. Why can Brazil make one of these? You know, what's missing in Brazil to be able to develop the technology, the know-how, the production um, infrastructure to invent an iPhone or something related to that, right? And that silence, right? Because there's a huge, huge gap between what we can do in Brazil now with the capability that we have and what's being done here. And if you go to the internet and you search for a measure to kind of have some sort of quantitative understanding of the differences, one good one, it's not the only one, but a good one is the number of patents which are submitted a year per capita per country, right? And there's a ranking, and you can look, and you can see not just the number of patents that are submitted, because one thing is submit a patent, the other is to get the patent, right? But the number of patents which are actually given, right? And um, so there is a very well, um, you can go and look for yourself. I actually have a list here by my, my phone. Uh, and so how does Brazil fit into this? So it turns out that if you look at the numbers, okay, the numbers are always the right suspects. You know, you have Japan, United States, China, Germany, uh, are sort of like way ahead of the game, okay? And then you have a second bunch, and Brazil, um, in numbers of submitted patents in 2014, at least, if I remember the numbers right, was the 10th in the world, which is awesome, right? Um, but the number of accepted patents was not even half of the number of submitted patents. And when you look at that, Brazil drops down, like between the 20 and 30th, okay? Now, if you look at the rest of Latin America, say, how does Brazil fit in the last, you know, the rest. And again, because of its size, because of the economy, Brazil is way ahead. You know, Argentina is not a close second, but is number two, okay. So, from a Latin American perspective, you say, okay, Brazil is not doing too bad. From a global perspective, Brazil is doing quite bad, given the size of the country, right? The fundamental issues with Brazil, in Brazilian education, and I would say that that is true for most of Latin American education as well, is that we have this interesting system where up to universities, you have the public school system and you have the private school system, right? And people with means send their kids to the private schools mostly. There are some heroic exceptions of good public schools, but they're very, very few. When I was growing up, there were some very good ones in Rio called Colegio de Aplicação. I'm sure the people from Rio will remember that. Um, those are not that good anymore. And why am I saying this? Because when I talk to my American colleagues here in academia, they say, you know, Brazil has this amazing system where universities, public universities are almost free. And here, those of you who have kids, you know, if you're going to send a kid to a good school here, it's going to be sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. So uh, they say, "Wow, you know, why don't you send your kids to university in Brazil?" Well, that's another conversation, you know. But the point is that to get to those private public schools, which are indeed very, very cheap in Brazil, 
you have to go to this tremendous bottleneck, which is the exams to get into the university. And to pass those exams, you have to be in the, better, in the best high schools. Now, what are the best high schools? Well, they're the private schools. So the people that have real access to the best public education in Brazil are the privileged kids that go through the private school system, middle school and high school, right? And then they get the best positions because, you know, if you apply for engineering at the Federal University of Rio or at the University of Sao Paulo, there may be 100, 150 openings for thousands of kids applying. So the kids that go to the public uh, school uh, system, they have a, dis a major disadvantage in this competition. And there is nothing more important you know, to these kids than to give them a chance to succeed. Because nobody pays attention to public school teachers in Brazil. Right? Very few people do. They are underpaid, severely underpaid. And that's another one of the big issues with Brazilian education. Because, um, just let me just throw this in. What good uh, student uh, that knows that he or she has a chance to get a job in finance, in medicine, in engineering, whatever it is, is going to choose to be a public school teacher knowing that the salary is going to be, what, not even $500 a month. You know? Very few, right? I mean, why would you do that? You know? So what happens is you have a deficit you know, in who is doing it, and then Apart from that, you have teachers, and that's actually true to a certain extent in the United States, believe it or not, that a lot of the public school teachers here say you're, you're really prepared to, to be a teacher of English, but you're going to teach history, you're going to teach PE, you're going to teach something else. But in Brazil, this is a massive problem. Right? <coughs> and the person teaching math doesn't know a lot of math, right? doesn't like math because he or she is like a teacher of geography and, 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 and is a person that did not want to study math in school. Now, how is that person going to inspire a kid to enjoy math or physics or whatever it is if he or she doesn't even like it? How do you do that, right? How can you sell the fish that you don't eat? Right? It's, it's really very hard. So, so these are systemic problems that I think we have there. And, um, and I can't say that I'm completely up to date with the latest policies right now in Brazil. I do know that, as you probably all know, there was some massive cuts of financing for science in Brazil. Some of it has been remedied, but when a country says in, 2020, in 2019 that they're going to cut 42% of the science budget, that country is deciding to go in a way which is very different from the way that Korea, Japan, India, absolutely essential for everybody to understand. You cannot have a successful science program without sustained sponsorship. You cannot say, because you know, if you look at the history of, 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 of uh, research sponsoring in Brazil, it's like a roller coaster. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And you know, a lot of fundamental science pro projects, they take years. You need long-term planning. You need five, 10 years planning. So you can't do, have a lab that costs $200 million to build, and then next year, you know, they cut the funds because you can't move forward with that. And this has happened in Brazil many times. You know. The private sector working with the universities to sponsor research, which is something that is a no-brainer nowadays in the United States. Every big university in the United States has a huge office that facilitates this conversation between the private sector and the engineering and the scientific you know, laboratories and universities. And because of the federal funds in the United States too, are not as, let's say, widespread as you would like the private sector is coming in. They are developing these amazing partnerships. There is a Rua Ne law in Brazil, for those of you who know about, which is a wonderful thing, which basically says that companies can donate some of their tax income to sponsor cultural projects. 
and that has been a very successful lot. We have something like that for science, but not even close to being that effective. But it should be there, right? Because that's how you do. So wait, so uh, Vale do Rio Doce has fiscal incentives to actually pour money into the University of Sao Paulo to do some kinds of research, wonderful. Or other, other private companies, not just uh, government companies. That sort of alliance is essential nowadays, and it's missing. Because, you know, engaging the private sector is kind of our role of being the intermediary as an NGO, uh, working with the private sector, taking the methodology and instilling that within the system, within the public sector, because that's where we have the sphere of influence, right? So what I, I see we've, with the methodology that we've been using <coughs> in capacitating the teachers to use hands-on activities in the classroom, we don't even need technological incentives because it's the knowledge that is the driver. It is the skill set that's the driver, and the teachers are transformed with new technologies, and they become rock stars to the students. And so the students are realizing, wow, I'm really learning something that I can apply in the real world. world. I'm learning Excel. You know, I'm learning GeoGebra. I'm learning technologies and different kind of Arduino. I'm, I'm building little machines to do to water the plants you know when I travel so these kinds of things in themselves <laughs> don't even require incentives it's like the human capital incentive that we're trying to bring and I think Marcelo we all feel frustrated uh, in every country not just in Brazil but I think we feel so frustrated with a lot of things that the system is bigger than we are and we have a hard time breaking and penetrating and making those public policy changes, you know. But what we've tried to do over the years is really have a bottoms-up approach. You know, I think in terms of the sphere of influence of Educando, at the board level we always spoke about, should we go top down or should we go bottom up? But really we've always went bottom up because we didn't really have the ability to go top down. <laughs> and in the end, that's what we can do, I think, as citizens as thoughtful persons who are trying to improve education in a huge, what do you say, BMO, right? A, a huge uh, <coughs> infrastructure. We have to start at the bottom up, do what we can do. And, you know, as we get more interest in science and, and technology, uh, things change from the ground level. The teacher salaries are low. Yes, they are. But the amount of money spent in salaries is not low in Brazilian public schools and universities. The, 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 you have to blame not the salaries, but the system, as you mentioned. If you can't fire, and if, if you don't give incentives for the best, you, 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 you take a, a huge university like the Universidade Federal de Rio de Janeiro, the second in size in Brazil, they have five, uh, 15,000 students and about 50,000 persons in the payroll including teachers, servants, cleaning people, blah 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 blah. One to one. Universidade de Brasília is one to four. So that you have to pay well, the salaries are low for everybody, for the good, the bad and the absent teachers. So it's a question not of the salaries, of the system again.